Go ahead. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, picking up with, if I remember correctly, I sent you a video for the two odes, so we're not going <clears> to <throat> discuss those. So picking up with Robert Frost, page 711 in the 11th edition, 889 in the 10th edition, the poem Acquainted with the Night. <clears throat> and then we're going to do two others before getting to the material that's assigned for it <clears throat> today. Turns out it wasn't just allergies, it was a bad cold because my wife now has it and I'm still not over it. <clears throat> I have <clears throat> excuse me. I have been one acquainted with the night. I have walked out in rain and back in rain. I've outwalked the furthest city light. <clears throat> I have looked down the saddest city lane. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. I've stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street, but not to call me back or say goodbye. And further still, at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been one acquainted with the night. Notice <clears throat> in that poem, notice the punctuation and what the punctuation does with how one should read the poem. Okay? If you don't have a marker punctuation at the end of a line, you just read it right on to the next line without a pause. If you do have a marker punctuation, you take a pause. If it's a comma, it's a short pause, semicolon, slightly longer period, longer than that. So the first stanza, three short declarative sentences. Each one ends with a period. I've been one acquainted with the night. Pretty clear. I've walked out in rain and back in rain. So when the speaker leaves, it's raining. When the speaker returns, it's still raining. I have outwalked the furthest city light. You know, that could simply mean that the speaker li uh, lives at the edge of the city. Okay? Or it could be that it's a small town where it's very easy to go past the last street light. I have looked down the saddest city lane. Again, one sentence ends, and then we get. So I have looked down the saddest city lane. How can streets be sad? I mean, it's anthropomorphizing a street. Well, if the speaker's talking about walking at night, what sometimes is taken to be, let's say, an element of sadness for an individual, for a person. I just read an article yesterday, or I looked at the headline, I haven't read the article yet. There is a, a problem in the world. It's a huge problem. And it's felt not just by Americans, or Europeans, or Russians, or whatever. It's kind of global. And it's this idea, or this problem of isolation, loneliness. Everybody seemingly, according to surveys, feels lonely, like they're not connected, even though we are supposedly the most connected people in the world. Is the saddest city lane because there's nobody there? It's just empty and desolate? Then you get the next line, which runs on. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes. What's the watchman? We don't use that word anymore. Cop, policeman, on his beat. This is back when cops walked a beat. Okay, So he passes a policeman and does what? We're told, dropped my eyes. Why? He doesn't want to look him in the face. He doesn't want to talk. I mean, what's a good way to avoid having a conversation with somebody? Look away, <laughs> look down, don't look him in the eyes, don't visually engage, okay? Unwilling to explain. Explain what? 
What often happens, not all the time, but I will say often, happens to primarily young or youngish, <laughs> young is a relative term, black males driving around late at night, especially in a quote unquote white neighborhood. They'll get stopped by cops for no other reason than being a young black male driving around late at night in a white neighborhood. It's, that's it. This person probably is not black, okay? But what's he unwilling to explain? What are you, what are you doing walking so late at night? Why, why are you out here? What's going on? I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street. Notice it all runs along, it jumbles on. Because the running on, the jumbling on, is the exact opposite of what the meaning of the words say. Because the meaning of the words is, I stopped. I'm not running on, I'm not ambling along. Stopped why? Stopped the sound of feet. His own feet, not others. When, far away, an interrupted cry, notice the cry is cut off, it stopped, came over houses from another street, like the next street over. So the person's walking, he hears a voice, the person stops, the voice stops. And then we get the next stanza. But not to call me back or say goodbye. What did the person think the cry was? Not boo-hoo cry, yelling, a loud voice. What did the person think that was when the speaker stopped? What's that line? Ten say. but not to call me back or say goodbye. So the speaker is left a dwelling with somebody else in it. And the implication is that when the speaker left, there might have been maybe some tension or maybe the, the speaker did not leave on the best of terms. Because notice the two options. The voice doesn't say, come back, which is an indication of either I'm sorry or we don't want you to go, stay here, this is safe, or to say goodbye. And further still at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. What's the luminary clock against the sky? The moon. Okay. Why is the time neither wrong nor right? Wrong nor right for what? We don't know. Why is the person out walking at night? In the rain and out of the rain. I have been one acquainted with the night. What is the night? Literally, it's clear, right? It's nighttime. What is it maybe symbolically? What is it metaphorically? What can night be used as? What kind of terminology do we use to describe, or sometimes, what kind of terminology is used to describe certain Conditions, certain moods. Like if someone is depressed. He uses language of there's a darkness around them. In fact, someone who is severely depressed, suicidally depressed, will talk about being in a tunnel with no light at the end. Well, that's being in the night. What color did Hamlet dress in? All black. What did both his mother and stepfather say 
about Hamlet. They described him in his black moods, black melancholy, his benighted color. Okay? And he uses all that kind of against them because that's all what? That's all something someone can show. Is this speaker doing this for show? Speaking this poem for show? I don't think so. I, I think this is someone who's wrestling with some severe issues. And why does the speaker go out and walk? Have you ever been depressed? Have you ever been disturbed? I don't mean disturbed like crazy. I mean, life's just coming at you all sides. And you can't put up a shield. And you just have to go do something. When I was in my early 20s, I battled that kind of depression. And one of the things I did, which is why this poem resonates so much, is this was on Lookout Mountain down outside Chattanooga, is I'd go for long walks on the mountain, like four or five mile walks at midnight when there's fog everywhere, okay? Or go for a run down the mountain, down to Point Park, then back up, or down to the Lookout Plus and back up. Why? That physical activity does what? It makes you take your mind off of whatever that problem is. Some have read this poem as possibly indicating the suicidal mindset. And the moon as the clock. Well, what's the Latin for moon? Lunar. Luna. What term do we get from that? Or what words derive from the loon? Lunatic. Loony. Okay. Go from there to... Um, we're going to do the road not taken last. Stopping by woods on a snowy evening, 881. Put that one there. <coughs> this is uh, 1107 in the 10th edition. One thing, I'm trying to think how to put this. One thing about all poetry, you got to read it aloud. You have to hear the sounds of it. And Frost is, you'll get more benefit of that from Frost than you will from quite a few poets. His, his poems are very aural, A-U-R-A-L, okay? Just listen to this poem. In that sense, he's very much like Shakespeare. Shakespeare's sonnets definitely meant to be heard. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near between the woods and frozen lake the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep. And miles to go before I sleep. And miles to go before I sleep. Now, Frost is from New England, so he would have been very w aware of winter snow and the snow piling deep and such. But look at the narrative of this poem. Look at the story the poem tells. So we have a speaker, and he's on horseback. And he's out in the woods. Whose woods these are, I, I think I know. In other words, this isn't my property. This is somebody else's property. But the person doesn't live in these woods. The person who owns the woods doesn't live in these woods. His house is in the town, in the village. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. Look at those two verbs in that last line. To watch his woods fill up with snow. What does the phrase to fill up mean? Louder? Make it full. Make it full. Notice it's not just to watch it snowing in his woods. 
Okay? It's to watch the woods fill up. How do woods fill up with snow? How long do you have to stay there and watch that? A long time. Notice, I'm stopping to watch the woods fill up. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. The horse is like, um, I don't see any lights around here. Why are we stopping? Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. So there's a frozen lake, we're now told. The woods are here. And the man on horseback is between the woods over here and the lake over here. And then we're told it's the darkest evening of the year. Now that just might be metaphor or could refer to, by darkest, the longest evening of the year, December 21st. Okay? So he's not actually in the woods. He's outside the woods looking in. And it's cold. Not only because it's snowing, how cold is it? The lake is frozen. For a lake to freeze, it's got to be really cold for a long time. So they're sitting out there. Well, he's sitting, the horse is standing. Out there, bitterly cold, and it's snowing. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. What does that mean, to ask if there is some mistake? What's the horse doing by shaking its harness bells? Two things, at least. How, how does a horse shake its harness bells? It moves its head around. You know, horse's head, big, long neck. It does this. What are the two reasons? One, to shake the bells. What else? What's happening while the horse just sits here? The snow's piling up. The horse is getting cold. It does this to shake the snow off. That's what causes the bells to ring. Notice, he gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. That's the speaker reading into the horse's actions. The horse going, let's get a move on. What's the horse really doing? I'm cold. Okay. The only other sounds, the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. Easy wind. This isn't a blizzard. This isn't a massive snowstorm. This is kind of a gentle fall and there's a light breeze. How do you know it's a gentle snowfall? Downy flake. Those flakes are just drifting down. What kind of imagery is that though? I mean, look, just think of that line and imagine it in your mind's eye. Easy wind and downy flake. Why is the flake described as downy? What other, what other things do we describe or do we use the term downy for? Mm -hmm. Louder? Mm -hmm. Feathers, keep going. What do we often, well, we don't anymore. What do people used to use feathers for? Mm -hmm. Pillows and blankets and mattresses. Why? They're soft. Notice, these aren't the external feathers like you have on a duck or goose or chicken. These are the under feathers, the downy, the really soft feathers, okay? Of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep. But I have promises to keep. Why but? Why not and? What does the but imply? Say that again? He can't stay there. Okay. Does he want to? Yes, he does. Why and how long? He wants to watch the woods fill up. How long will that take? Hours. What will happen to the speaker if the speaker stays there for hours as the wood fills up? 
you're going to die. Many critics read this as a longing for death, a longing for suicide, essentially. Notice how the woods are described. Of easy wind and downy flake, the woods are lovely, dark, and deep. Like, I could go in there and just lay down and go to sleep. Ah, to sleep, perchance to dream, Hamlet would say at that point. But, but what? I have promises to keep. Meaning? He can't die. Why not? You're right. Keep going. There are people he has responsibilities and obligations to. He has promises to keep. We don't know what those promises are. I mean, one could be marriage. Could be he has children, business partners, all kinds, all the relationships we have in our lives. In one sense, you could say those involve promises. And I've missed a lot of, more than usual class this semester because of allergies and whatnot. That's a quote unquote kind of a breaking of a promise. You know, beginning of a semester, we make promises, you make promises. Your promises are to do the assigned work, whatever that is. Our promises to show up and do our jobs, okay? He's got promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep. And notice, and miles to go before I sleep. Why the emphasis? Why the repetition? What's the speaker want to do? I just want to lay down and go to sleep. Just why? It's like the speaker is just tired of life. I just want to go to sleep. Just the end. But I can't. I've got those responsibilities. I've got those promises to fulfill. Okay? Now go to the road not taken. <coughs> 871. How many of you have heard or read this before? You've probably heard of it or you've heard phrases from it. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to see to where it bent in the undergrowth. Page 871 or 1107. 881, no, 871 and 1091. Then took the other as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So, speakers out for a walk in the wood. and there's a fork in the road. What kind of wood? It's yellow. What does that indicate? It's fall. Which indicates? Middle age, slightly past middle age, possibly, I'm not saying it has to, but usually when Life is described in terms of sprit of seasons and it's fall. It means you're past prime. You're heading towards death. 
Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. In other words, sorry I couldn't clone myself and take both. Why would one want to do that? Yeah, what's down here and what's down here? I've been backpacking before, my dad and brother, you know. Sometimes we had a route all planned out. Sometimes we just kind of took our topographical maps, knew the general area we were in in the Sierra Nevada at Yosemite, and we'd go, let's go this way. And there might be a little side, well, let's see where it goes, kind of a thing. Long I stood, that is, stands here and says, shoot, I can't take them both. How do I know which one to take? And look down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. So he looks down, and this one does this, and it turns on this way. So he stands here, and he can see to this point. Then took the other. As just as fair, that is, from this vantage point, this road and this road, they're identical almost. As just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted where. Wanted means lax. It's like nobody had walked this path in the morning. Though as for that, the passing there, it warned them really about the same. That is, this path was just as worn is this one. And both, both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. That is, this particular day, nobody has been on this, this road before. I'm the first one. <coughs> oh, I kept the first for another day. I'm going to take this road, but I'll come back at some point. And I'll take this one. Notice what that mentality says. That this is what kind of day. What kind of walk. Poems over here. Drive the car. Park. Get to the trailhead. Walk down. Find a path. Do a loop or something. Come back. Go back home. Next day, come back to this. That's what those lines up to that point kind of imply. I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. And what has the poem just become? Or what has this walk just become? So way leads on to way. He's going to follow this one, and what's it going to do at some point? It just keeps forking. Because what is it? This is life. This is his journey through life. Decision point, decision point, decision point, decision point, decision point, decision point, all the way down the line. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Shall be means what? In the future. I'll be telling this with a sigh. Why ages and ages? What does age usually imply? And I don't mean what's your age. When we talk about time as in age, what do we mean by that? Is that a year? Is that two years, five years, ten years? No. An age is usually a hundred years or a thousand years kind of a thing. All right? It's a long time. Ages in ages. That's kind of implying hundreds or thousands of years in the future. I shall be telling this. Well, obviously not in this, because this will be dead. And I'll be telling it with a sigh. 
What does what do size usually imply? A little bit of regret, a little bit of sorrow, a little bit of I wish I had. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. Less traveled, what does that mean, less traveled by? The way it's usually interpreted, the way it's interpreted in kind of popular culture when this is referenced is, I march to the tune of my own drummer. This road, this is the road the mass of humanity follow. Me, I thumb my nose at the mass of humanity and I go off in the different direction. I take the harder road. I take the more difficult road. I am the individual as opposed to the collective, so to speak. Two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Why? Is it because the speaker, ages and ages hence, is going to be alone? Not necessarily. So what is the poem entirely? And this is how it's always read. It's a metaphor for life. Every one of us is on this road. And every one of us arrives at this point. And this point, it comes almost daily. Because every one of us has to make decisions every day. Some of those are trite, stupid little decisions. What should I have for breakfast? What clothes should I wear? Others are more major decisions. What major? Because your major it, to some extent, determines, you know, job stuff. Uh, should I take this job or not? Should I buy this car? Should I buy this house? Should I marry this person? Should I go out with this person? Should I? And they do what? Every one of those just blossoms into infinite possibilities, right? Because this right here, is it really only two choices? Not usually. Usually there's a whole realm but what happens once you make that choice? If you choose this one, that's gone. If you choose this one, that's gone. If you choose this one, that's gone. Those decisions never come back again. I mean, you could say, yeah, you get married, doesn't work out, you get divorced, you remarry. Does that undo? No, it doesn't. You pull the trigger. It's not a Warner Brothers cartoon. The bullet still pew, <laughs> go from there to. Uh, da, 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 da. We're going to skip Pied um, Scarborough Fair for right now. Go to Pied Beauty, ten fifty four. Gerard Manley Hopkins, another poem of his, <coughs> the one who did God's Grandeur that we read before. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow, and plow, and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, and a dazzle dim. He fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Now, it's a praise poem, okay? That's pretty clear. What else is it? What's the poem simply declaring? And you don't have to get all deep. Glory to God for what? Variety in life. Not a single person in here looks the same. Not a single person here is dressing the same. It's not like you have uniforms to come in. Look outside. 
Everything is different. That's it. How horrible would it be if we lived in Orwell's 1984, where we all had the same color clothes, in the same clothes? It would be horrible, okay? That's all I want to say about that one. Next one, 1056. Keats, nice little sonnet. <clears throat> to one who has been long in city pent. Pent means pent up, stuck. Okay, City probably refers to the city of London. Not what we think of as London today, but the actual city of London, which is a one mile essentially area of central London. It's the original part of London. If you go to London today, you walk down the Strand, okay? At some point, you will see, as you're walking down the Strand, let's say you're coming from Westminster and you're going to the east part of London, you're walking down the Strand, you'll come in right in the middle of the street. There will be a big plinth, and on top of that plinth, a dragon. And the dragon faces outward from the city of London. If you keep walking down that street and go all the way through, the city of London, the downtown, which called today the financial district, you'll come to another plinth in the middle of the road, and on top of it, a dragon. And the dragon faces the other direction. This is an old idea. These dragons have been there for hundreds of years. Why? They're protecting the city, metaphorically. There's one facing north, going out of the city. There's one facing south. There are several of these. Where each of these was located originally had been a gate that allowed you to go in and out of London. Okay, So the city itself is probably that. Keats didn't live in the city. He had a house the north of that. It's in what's called Hempstead, the Hempstead area. To one who has been long in city pent, tis very sweet to look into the fair and open face of heaven to breathe a fair, excuse me, to breathe a prayer full in the smile of the blue firmament. Who is more happy when, with heart's content, fatigued he sinks into some pleasant lair of wavy grass and reads a debonair and gentle tale of love and languishment. Returning home at evening with an ear catching the notes of Philomel, an eye watching the sailing cloudlet's bright career, he mourns that day so soon has glided by, e'en like the passage of an angel's tear that falls through the clear ether silently. Okay? So the first eight lines, kind of an Italian um, sonnet form, the first eight lines give us the description. Someone who's been stuck in the city for a long time, who does what? That person, tis very sweet to look in a fair and open face of heaven to breathe a prayer full in the smile of the blue firmament. What's the blue firmament? The sky. The fair face of heaven is seeing the blue sky. Why? Because when Keats is writing, that's when London itself, and where he lived, Hampstead, in Hampstead Heath, it's a hill that overlooks London. London was covered in coal smoke pretty much most of the time so someone who is living down in the center of London when they would look up it was like when I grew up in San Jose California what is now Silicon Valley San Jose used to have a horrible pollution problem not as bad as LA's but LA you know still applied and it still does today sometimes where you would look up and yeah you'd see the sky but it'd be kind of a dingy color we would every now and then, we'd go up into the Santa Cruz Mountains, which overlooks Silicon Valley, and you'd come through, literally, you could drive through and see the hazy area, and then look down and not see any of the valley. Because all you would see would, would be, would look like fog looking down on it, and it would be brown. I'm not kidding, brown, okay? That's kind of what he's describing. The person who is stuck in the city, who only experiences that, does what? Oh man, they love to get out of the city, 
to be able to look up and see blue sky. Who is more happy when with heart's content, full satisfaction, fatigued, he sinks into some pleasant layer of wavy grass, probably describing uh, Parliament Hill, which is a hill on the Hampstead Heath area, long grass, people would go to for picnics and such. To sink down into that grass, into that meadow grass, and read a tale of love and languishment. In other words, a romance tale, okay? Which we're going to read. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to jump way ahead of the syllabus in just a moment. Okay. Returning home at evening. Why? Because this is just a short break. The person's got to go back to work, so to speak. Return at home in evening with an ear catching the notes of Philomel, a nightingale, as it sings its night song, and I watches the little clouds scud across the sky. He, he mourns that day so soon has glided by. What was this moment? It was that moment of relaxation, of joy, of contentment, of just true happiness. But, how do you, I don't know about you, how do I feel Monday mornings? Oh, no, just, can't wait to get up and go, no, not really, I'd rather sleep in. Even like the passage of an angel's tear that falls through the clear ether silently. Okay, go from there to, Page 1057. This isn't a poem. I, have a, I, don't, I don't have this assigned until Wednesday, but we're going to do it today. 1057. Oh, right on the next page. Why are we doing this now? Because this is a tale, a debonair tale of love and languishment. And I kind of think, this is published in 1819. The other one's published in 1816. I kind of think this is exactly the kind of tale that Keats is talking about in the previous poem. Okay? La Belle d'Amsons Merci. The beautiful lady without mercy. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard and so woe begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest done. I see a lily on thy brow, with anguish moist and fever dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose, fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland for her head, and bracelets too, in fragrant zone, she looked at me as she did love and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing speed and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy song. She found me roots of relish sweet and honey wild and manna dew. And sure in language strange she said, I love thee true. She took me to her elfin grot. And there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses for her. And there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed, ah, oh, woe betide, the latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, La belle d'absence merci hath, hath, hath thee in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam with horrid warning gaped white, and I awoke and found me here on the cold hillside. And this is why I sojourn here alone and palely loitering, though the sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. OK? 
Okay. Someone addresses this night. What ails thee? Why are you alone and palely loitering? What's it mean to loiter? You'll see a sign sometimes. No loitering. What does it mean? No just hanging around. No waiting. No idling. Go. This guy is hanging around, waiting, just idling, palely. What's pale about him? His face. And the speaker says, why are you here? The sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. In other words, it's winter. Everything is dead around here. What are you waiting for? What can ail thee? So haggard and woe be gone. What's it mean to be haggard? That's why, by the way, J.K. Rowling names the character Hagrid. It sounds like Hagrid. Worn, kind of beat up. Not physically with punches, but beat down. Okay? The squirrel's granary is full. Again, it's winter. And the harvest done. I see a lily on thy brow that is up here. Why a lily? Is it a literal lily? No, it's not. It's pale. Lilies are white. With anguish, anguish moist and fever dew. This guy's feverish. She's sweating. And on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. What's the fading rose? Blush, as in he's literally blushing like he's ashamed of something? Probably not. The withering rose is the withering natural color caused by the capillaries in the skin. The blood is doing what? Draining from the guy's face. And then we hear the knight speak. I met a lady in the meads, in the meadows. Oh, beautiful. A fairy's child. Remember when I talked about Lawn Ball? How often in medieval literature, when the fairies come and they take a man, usually that man is taken off to the fairy realm as a sex slave. Okay? Full beautiful, a fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. Her foot was light, meaning she kind of dances around. I made a garland for her head, so he picks flowers. He's fallen in love with her. In bracelets, too. In fragrant zone. A belt. She looked at me as she did love and made sweet moan. It's not talking about having sex. It's she looks at him and just kind of moans for him. I set her on his steed. So he puts her on his horse and he walks. There's a beautiful painting of this, by the way, by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, um, one of the pre-Raphaelite poets. And it's the lady on the horse and she's leaning down and the knight's kind of looking up at her. It's just absolutely gorgeous. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy song. And that's the, what the image of that painting captures. She's leaning down, speaking into his ear. Why doesn't he, hear, why doesn't he see anything else during the day? He's enraptured. She sings a fairy song in his ear. She found me roots of relish sweet, honey wild, the men do. And sure, in language strange, she said, I love thee true. What does the sure mean? We would say it needs an, a lee on the end. And surely, she did what? In language strange, sang. But if the language is strange, how does he know what she sings? She's a fairy. Does she speak English? It's one of the problems I have with a lot of science fiction stuff. 
people go from here, they go off to some other planet somewhere, and lo and behold, they're all speaking English, like they've been you know, colonized by the United Kingdom or the United States kind of a thing. He's probably not speaking English, and he's assuming, she says, I love you. But as we'll come to find out, that's probably not what she's singing. She took me to her elfin grot, her cave, grotto, and there she wept and sighed full sore. And there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses four. Doesn't mean she has four eyes. He kisses each eye twice. And there she lulled me asleep. How? What's a lullaby? It's a song. It's a song designed to put one at ease, to still one. And there I dreamed. Lo, betide. Betide kind of means for all time, forevermore. Woe is me, because what does he dream? The latest dream I ever dreamed on the cold hillside. This is what he always sees, what he's going to describe next. So how does she lull him to sleep, and what is she singing to him? She's planting these images in his mind. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, gotcha! La belle d'Amsons merci hath thee in thrall. Who are these pale kings and princes too? More than likely, there are other men that she has in thrall. This guy now joins their throng. I saw their starved lips in the gloom with horrid warning gaped, gaped wide. Gloom could mean the gloom, the darkness. It could also mean the earth. He saw their gaped lips, their starved lips in the gloam, with horrid warning, gaped what? They're dead. And I awoke and found me here on the cold hill's side. And this is why I sojourned here, alone and palely loitering, though the sedge has withered from the lake and no bird say. Why is he there loitering? Is he waiting for her to come back? Or is he kind of standing as a sentinel, warning others? It's unclear. Okay, go from there. We've got two minutes. Page 731. <coughs> Very quickly. Scarborough Fair. This is a ballad, okay? This is anonymous. Dates from 1500 at least. All right. Most of the ballads in English literature um, survive in manuscripts dating from right around 1500 to 1600. But most of those songs probably were originally composed 100, 200, maybe 300 years earlier. Okay. They're all nearly all anonymous. So you have this ballad. And then in the 1960s, Simon and Garfunkel did their version of Scarborough Fair, which was very, very popular. It was like a number one, I think it was like number one song. And it modifies it a little bit. And that's, you've got a link um, in your syllabus, in the electronic version of your syllabus. You've got a link that will take you to a, I think it's a sound file, where you can listen to that song. <coughs> so, where are you going to Scarborough Fair, Parsley Sage, Rosemary, so that's the refrain, Parsley Sage, Rosemary in Time, Remember me to a bonnie last there, for once she was a true lover of mine. Notice, once was double past tense. Tell her to make me a cambric shirt without any needle or thread worked in it. So how do you make a shirt without a needle or thread? Kind of hard. 
and she shall be a true lover of mine. That is, if she makes me a shirt without needle and thread, then she'll be a true love of mine. Tell her to wash it in yonder well, where water ne'er sprung nor a drop of rain fell. So wash the shirt in a dry well, what? And she shall be a true lover of mine. What, what are we starting to, to get? What idea is coming across? She once was a true lover of mine, but she never will be again. Why? Because the speaker says, make her do this and make her do this. Then she'll be, and the things she's being told the man to do, she can't. Tell her to plow me an acre of land between the sea and the salt sea strand. Well, here's the ocean coming in. Okay. Here's the ocean. Here's the sand. Do you have an acre between the water and the sand? You have nothing between the water and the sand. And she shall be a true lover of mine. Tell her to plow it with one ram's horn. And sow it all over with one peppercorn. Sow the entire acre with one seed of pepper. Tell her to reap it with a sickle of leather. Tie it all up with a tom tit's feather. Tom tit is a bird about the size of my thumb. And she'll be a true lover of mine. Tell her to gather it all in a sack and carry it home in a butterfly sack. Back. And then she shall be a true lover of mine. What's the import of this poem? The dirty line sneaking. She cheated on me. That's implied. Why? How's it implied? Because she once was a true lover. That is a beautiful song. Listening to it. Listen to Simon and Garfield. Beautiful melody, harmony, the whole nine yards. The meaning, however, is she can't be trusted. The meaning is almost opposite to what the sound of the song says. Okay, we'll stop there, and we'll pick up with um, Passionate Shepherd to His Love on Monday. Have a good weekend. Wake up. <laughs>